I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name. I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name. I ran out of that grave yeah. Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you called my name, I ran out of that grave, yeah. out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, yeah. out of the darkness, into Amen. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You made me see Great start. Nice shirt. Thank you. You yeah, have a nice shirt you. as thank well. You. <laughs> like we planned it. Good morning. So good to see each and every one of you today. Ah, it's good to be back. Damn. You, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You can uh, How was it? How was it? Yeah, how was it? It was great. Was it? Yeah. It was great. Uh, Arizona was awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, you can pull out your weekly planner. Just take a look at that real quick. We have a couple of exciting things. Um, we are in March Gladness and Sean's going to come up and talk to us about that in just a second. Uh, but baptisms, we, we're, we're planning a baptism uh, on Palm Sunday, which is March 28th. So if you'd like to be baptized, you can fill that out. I believe it's on your green card. Yep, it is right there on the back. So uh, if you'd like to be baptized, you can fill that out, leave it in the offering plate in the back, 
and uh, we, will, we will be glad to baptize you. Um, also, another thing I want to announce is uh, Wednesday, youth, we are starting up a new series. Uh, we, we headed out of the frying pan series, which was awesome, uh, but we're heading into a new series, so make sure you're here uh, Wednesday at 7, because uh, this one I think is going to be good. It's going to be fun. So I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you, and there we go. It's on to you. Do you like my shirt as well, Matt? Yeah, I do. Just look at that. I mean, I just... That's a ball. It's a little... I mean, this is this was the most colorful thing I had in the closet. All right. Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Good. How many of you are familiar with uh, the faith chapter in the book of Hebrews? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the faith chapter. It's in chapter 11 of Hebrews, and it's one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture because the faith chapter talks about in the very beginning, I'm going to read it for you, since if you're not familiar, it says in chapter 11, it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, for it is, for by it, it the elders obtain a good testimony. Now, you know what a testimony is, right? That's, it's, uh, and without, the, without a test in your life, there is no testimony. Amen? Mm-hmm. Well, they, they, our forefathers had tests. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are, are seen were not made of things which are visible. You know, we have many, many things in our lives that we probably take for granted. And probably during this last year, would you agree that we probably have taken time to reflect a little bit more about the things we take for granted in our life more than any other time? And, and I believe that the faith of our forefathers who have paved the way, and that means the forefathers of our faith, it means the forefathers of this great nation that we live in, the forefathers of, of New Springfield Church of God, um, and I'm not being politically correct, but it's our forefathers and foremothers. You know what I mean? We talk about that in general. But when we talk about 122 years, 123 years as a church, those forefathers have paved the way by faith for you to be sitting in the very pew that you're sitting in this morning. When we built the New Springfield Church of God, uh, this final edition, um, not final, but this current edition of the New Springfield Church of God, the building, we are the church, but the building, um, right here where Aaron is sitting and Shannon, everybody, uh, who knows what we did on the, on the concrete floor underneath you? Ron and Laura, are you sitting on script, standing on scripture, sitting on scripture? We're standing on the word of God. We are standing on the word of God. And that's a figurative thing, um, but it's a literal thing too. But we're standing on the word of God and our forefathers uh, before us had great vision. And what was interesting is that if you turn to chapter 11, verse 13, it says that our forefathers, they all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. And what was interesting is that they, the faith that they had, they weren't always able to see it come to fruition. The things that we do uh, many times, and I'm standing among saints uh, right now. I know I, I look out at our congregation, and I know there's those who have given sacrificially and continue to give sacrificially because they're thinking about their kids and their and their grandchildren and generations to come. And so when we when we talk about March gladness, you know, it's great to have a it's great to have a uh, a theme. It's great to you know. Um, uh, have a, a fancy board out there with the numbers on it. The reality, though, is, is that you're making an investment by faith in what God is doing at New Springfield Church of God and how we are reaching the community, and we are discipling, and we are growing. We are the church. And so I want to encourage you that whether you're here for the first time today, um, whether you're here and you're a regular, whether you've never given uh, to it, be a part of, pray about being a part of the future of the New Springfield Church of God so that 50 years from now there may be 
a child or a grandchild that's sitting here that is a beneficiary of the New Beginnings Preschool, right? That um, somebody, Rini and Ted and many, even before that, had a vision for, now we're seeing God answer those prayers. And, and we have kids that are going to be discipled because of that. So um, take part in, in being a part of, we are literally eight or nine months away from being debt-free at this church, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and, and we're going to celebrate that. But uh, be a part of it um, in any way you can, small or large. There's no small part. The woman that gave her two mites gave more than the, the one that had um, maybe a lot more to give. But uh, it was all about the heart. So I encourage you to do that this morning. I want to offer up a prayer uh, for us this morning, just in, in, uh, for our service and just in regards to our future. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, that you are sovereign, that you are God, and that you love us, and that you are so gracious and so good to us, even when we don't deserve it, Lord. We thank you for that grace. Lord, we thank you for the saints that have gone before us. Lord, let us learn from their faithfulness. Let us learn, Lord, that it's not always the things that we see that are the things that are most important. In fact, your word teaches us that it is not the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, because that's where our faith grows. Help us to have faith, Lord, to take out a step out when we feel nervous or we feel uh, uncomfortable, and know that you are right there with us, that you are holding our hand, Lord, that you have proven yourself to be faithful again and again and again, and that you will do so because you are a faithful God. Lord, we, we love you. We thank you for this church. We thank you for those that are here this morning, those that are listening, those that are watching. Lord, we ask that you would move our hearts this morning, that you would stir up a hunger in us this morning for you that we have never felt before, Lord that we would be salt and light in the world that so greatly needs hope in a time of hopelessness. Lord, we're thankful for the filling of your spirit that allows us to do that. Lord, that we are ambassadors for you, and we're grateful for that opportunity. Lord, we ask that you be with our service this morning. Lord, that we put away all of the things that maybe we brought in here this morning, the distractions, the things, Lord, that would take us away that the, that the devil would want to distract us from worship this morning. We want to put those aside. We want more of you this morning, Lord. We love you. And we come with grateful hearts and ask you to be with us this morning. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 We stand. Just give God praise.
take a special little break here for a second because I want to recognize a couple of people uh, in our congregation today. And I have been really excited this week, um, waiting for uh, Laban and Jennifer to come home uh, after their their anniversary, or after their wedding. Uh, Getting a little ahead of ourselves there. But uh, I've been excited and waiting for them. And I just want you to kind of understand the gravity of what's going on because I don't think uh, most of us understand, but Jennifer um, lived, or her church was in Norton uh, over by Akron, and she lived in that area, and she is literally moving away from everything she's grown up with, and so most of us, we don't do that. I mean, we might move or something like that, but it's a completely new adventure for her, and so I think that that takes an incredible step of faith, <laughs> not only to get married, <laughs> Uh, but to completely move to a different environment. And I had the joy of, uh, my family and I had the joy of going to their wedding last, not yesterday, but a week ago, and, and just had a really fun time and, and meeting some people. And I got to talk to Jennifer's parents uh, quite a bit during uh, the reception. Well, her mom told me this story that, if Laban had told me before it went in one ear, when I, I don't remember hearing it. I mean, you might have told me. I don't know. But um, I'm going to have the, they have no idea. I'm like, shoot, everything they've been through this week, this will be easy. So uh, if you two will come up here for a second, please, because um, I want everyone to see who uh, Jennifer is and uh, you know who Laban is. Hello, my name is Laban. <laughs> he has the low voice. Um, Many of you guys have participated in thank you and welcoming, welcoming them home. And you've brought in gifts and cards and everything. And so maybe today um, they can, after the service, go home and relax and, and go through those if, if they want to do it today. But your mom, Jennifer, told me this story. And I, this is talk about putting her on the spot. Maybe Laban can tell it if Jennifer doesn't want to. But it was about um, a blue butterfly. Okay, does that ring a bell? Would one of you tell the story of the blue butterfly? Okay, tell the story. This is amazing uh, when you hear this. Um, Better be good, lady, because I've hyped it up. I I know you did. I know you did. I'll I'll try and make it. I'll I'll give you all the abbreviated version, but (laughs) I'll tell the good parts. (laughs) 
So uh, Jennifer and I, we, we uh, worked together at Chick-fil-A for a long time. Uh, that's how we met. Uh, but we, we had talked about entering a relationship years ago, you know, three years ago or something like that. And it just didn't work out for reasons, for, you know, timing reasons. I, I, it was, well, well the, you've, you've heard it before, uh, right person, wrong time. It's, it really was the right person at the wrong time. It, and uh, so we had talked, uh, I, here's, here, here, here's how it happened, okay? It, it all started with Jonathan. <laughs> no. Well, I we, didn't hear this part no. before. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it, it started when, when Jonathan reached out to me and about taking the, the position here as, as your youth pastor. And, and so that was when I decided that I was going to move on from the Chick-fil-A life and uh, <laughs> move out here to be, to be your youth pastor. And I'm a very reflective person. And so when I, when I was leaving, I was really reflective of my time at Chick-fil-A. And there was just one person that I just couldn't, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't, it didn't feel right leaving. And, and I, uh, I didn't know what it, exactly that meant, so we, we met, we talked, and, and we talked about possibility of entering a relationship again. And, and so she told me to pray about it. And so I prayed about it, and, and I, I did some homework in, in, in the Word and, and watching every sermon series on relationships I could think of, and and she gave me a few suggestions as well. <laughs> but she came back from a, a vacation that she was on, and, and we decided to meet and talk. And she was sitting in her, her car um, before we, we went on our little walk that turned into a five-mile hike up hilly roads and, and all that good stuff. Uh, but <laughs> she was sitting in her car, and, and she said, Lord, I, I don't know about this, um, if you could just send me a sign, I, I would really appreciate that. Just, just show me a blue butterfly. And uh, she, was, she kind of went back and forth with whether that was <laughs> okay or not. And, and she, she ultimately said, Lord, I'd just leave it in your hands. And, and so we were on a walk talking about relationships and, and uh, what I felt the Lord leading me and and sure enough, this boo butterfly comes up and it just smacks her right in the face. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> just, Literally. Just smacks her right in the face. And, and I don't know what's going on. I, I'm just wa- I, I didn't know that she prayed that prayer. I was just walking and she's like, did you see that? And I was like, see what? And she's like, this blue butterfly came up and just smacked me right in the face. I was like, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> but we got to the end of our walk and... And uh, we, we sat down and we, we, we talked it over and we prayed about it. And, and that's when we decided to enter a relationship together. And, and there we go. That's the story of the blue butterfly. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So a couple of weeks later, they got married. It was not enough. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm teasing. So isn't that a neat story of faith and stepping yeah. out? And uh, that's lets you know of Jennifer's heart a little bit more, which I've come to love and respect. So I, I appreciate both of them, and I am glad they're here and a part of it and uh, part of things, and we'll let you off the spot now. So thank you for being here and coming and being a part of things. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yes. we can do that. Yeah. 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 Why don't you, well, let's uh, do our uh, COVID prayer. Yeah. And would you pray for them, uh, Lisa? Lisa, you have to do a mic, though, so that people at home can hear you. <clears throat> That's a great idea. I've not met Jennifer or Laban face-to-face, actually, so this is good. We're going to pray. Father God, I thank you so much for the institution of marriage. I thank you, God, that you designed that you would place one man and one woman together. And Lord, we pray for this couple here, Father God. 
Lord, we pray for Laban and Jennifer that you would bless their marriage. We pray, Father God, that you would draw them closer to you, for as they are drawn closer to you, they are drawn closer to each other. We pray for their ministry. We pray for their relationship. Father God, we just pray that you would grant them many years together serving you and building the kingdom. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. you, Lisa. I like that spontaneity. Anybody else need prayer? <laughs> or maybe an unspoken? Can I raise your hand if you have an unspoken? Thank you, Jesus. God, he sees them. How many of you need a sign? You need a butterfly to come smack you in the face? <laughs> heard a lot about butterflies. I think of Becky talking about a butterfly with her dad. Or was it your mom, one of the two? <clears throat> yeah, love this. Just as quiet. Be still and know that I'm God. Father, we lift up those that raised their hand that had an unspoken request. You know them. You're deeply concerned about them. We just figuratively lay them at your feet. Our cares, our concerns, our worries. Oh, you're big enough to take care of them, God. We give them to you. I want nothing to inhibit our time with you now, our worship with you. Clear the space, clear the air that we, we breathe right now in the space we have with you. Just you and me, just you and me, just us and you. Thank you for this place to do that. Thank you, Jesus. You can stand. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough. And you came along And you put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in love Oh, there's nothing Better Show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place, oh, your mercy and grace won't find me again.
turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who cares. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the I can't believe it. Yes, yes. So good, too good to be true. It is true. Thank you, Lord. So faithful, so faithful. Good, good, Father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but i've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that i'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for.
I feel like I should, could go run a marathon or something. I'd feel like that right to the end of the sanctuary. <clears throat> I'd be over that feeling really quick. We are talking about tithing today. Um, we talked about finances and that last week as well. and We're continuing on with that today and being good stewards and what that looks like and everything. And I just want to start by... You know, I told a syrup story uh, last week, uh, if you guys remember that, and you know that God even blesses with syrup. Do you guys, rem- anybody remember that? Okay. So, <clears throat> if you remember that story, and the reason we need so much syrup, just by the way, or syrup, or however you say it, um, <clears throat> is because my wife makes incredibly good pancakes, okay, and gluten-free pancakes on top of that. In fact, I would rather have Jennifer's gluten-free pancakes than normal pancakes, all right? That's how good they are to me. And not only does she make them most Saturdays, but also I get a container for the whole week. So all week I can warm them up and do that. So that kind of gives you an understanding of why 
so much syrup is needed and how that becomes valuable currency in our house, right? So anyway, <clears throat> you remember the story and how, uh, you know, we ordered it, it got lost. Uh, Jennifer called Target or wherever we got it from. And they said, hey, we'll send you more. And if the first two come, don't worry about it, right? You can have all four. Well, God bless uh, the Holloway household because they all came, all right? And we got to keep them all. So I told that story last week. So I come into my office Monday, <clears throat> and guess what was on the doorstep? <sighs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the exact kind that we get. These are bigger jugs than I've ever seen in this before. But someone found them on Amazon. I don't know. They sent it as a gift, so I don't know who did it. I've asked a couple of people that I thought might do that. But blessings, folks. That's all I can, that's, that's all I can say. They're so heavy that I can't even like ha- hardly hold them up, which goes back to the marathon comment. But anyway, those, that, they're, they're so heavy. And a couple of you said, hey, <clears throat> My grandkid heard your story, and, and um, I think the Vickers, uh, Lily, heard me talking and like told Ted, Ted, we have got to take him some syrup, all right? And Ted makes it with his own trees, you know what I'm saying? So he, he makes it the, the real way. And I think, do you guys make it too? Because McKenna and I were driving by uh, down Brungard Road yesterday. Is that that little shack by the pond? Okay. And it, it dawned on me, like, yeah, it's all over. People are making syrup. This is awesome. Um, it had nothing to do with my sermon. It was going to happen either way. But uh, I just kind of put two and two together when I drove by yesterday because I saw uh, Dick's truck down by this little shack or what, what do you call it? Sugar shack. Woo. You go all kinds of way with that, all kinds of ways with that. So we're going to read about... Um, some people in the Bible. If you want to turn to Matthew 25, and we're going to read about three servants. And I love, whenever I'm talking about tithing, I, I, I love to start with this story. Matthew 25. It's before the sheeps and the goats. Um, but Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Sheeps and the goats start at 31. Uh, so Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Because it's not, it's not all, we're not going to put all that up here. So he gave one each according to his ability then excuse me then the master went on his journey well if you're familiar with this story what happens is this the the servant that was giving five given five talents all right now i wrote this down too i want you to hear this uh a talent equals 20 years of a day laborer's wage all right that puts it into perspective how much money was given to these people, all right? So you can, I don't know what a day laborer makes, but you can, just if it was 10 bucks an hour, I mean, that's still a lot, okay, by, by our standards. So he went on his journey, and the, the servant who made the five, uh, was given the five talents, he went out, he invested the money, and he made five more. He, in other words, he doubled his money. He was a good steward with what he had, he doubled his money. When he goes down to the second servant, he was given two talents. And what did he do, if you're familiar with the story? He doubled his money and he earned two talents. He invested it. He made two talents. He was a good steward with his money. The third, who was given one talent, buried it, didn't do anything, didn't make any money, did nothing. So when the master came back, the response was to the man who had made five talents, earned, doubled his money, essentially, the comment to him was, well done. You did a great job. Way to, to, to do things, good job. Same thing to the person who had the two towns and doubled that to four, okay? Well, this is where it gets interesting to me is the one who didn't do anything, I would not want to be in his shoes because it goes a little bit something like this. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Uh, came. Master, he said, I knew you are a hard man. Probably not something you want to say to someone that trusted you with their money. 
harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. He buried it in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, this is where it gets a little ugly. You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Question mark. Well then, you should have put the money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have at least received some interest back. Take the talent from him, the man with one, and give it to the one with ten. For everything who, uh, for everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he is, uh, sorry, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ooh, that's pretty harsh words, wouldn't you say? I think that's pretty, pretty strong words there. So what were the first two? If you could define the first two in this story, the first two servants, they were what? They were good stewards with what they had. They were good with stewardship. Well, what does being good with stewardship, what stewardship mean? It basically means money management, all right? So here's the deal. In today's times, we hear these stories and we see people, um, uh, different stories on, online, or we hear athletes talking about, I need to make enough to feed my family, like because $25 million a year or something like that isn't enough to do that, all right? And so we have people who can make millions and millions and millions and millions and still be broke. That would be a poor steward right? A bad steward with what they have. And we have money on the, we have people on the other side who could make minimum wage and, and work 40 hours a week at minimum wage and somehow drive a Rolls Royce because they're, I'm being, I'm embellishing a little bit there, but because they're good stewards with what they have. Does that make sense? So God can give you, you can have, it's kind of a mindset, of, of two. Am I going to be good stewards? Am I going to invest? Am I going to save? And I, am I going to be generous? Am I going to do what God leads me to do? Am I going to be faithful? Am I going to step out in faith even with my finances? Or am I going to be stingy? Am I going to be a bad steward? Am I going to be wasteful? Am I going to spend on a whim? Am I going to buy stupid things that I don't need just because I can't? You know, what's funny is the... the, the um, in the, it, <laughs> this is funny because when, when we're not doing it this year, but when we have the, uh, that was a council decision, but when we have done the rummage sale in the past, it's so funny because of this. You buy something one year, and where does it end up the next year? Right back in the rummage sale. <laughs> you don't buy it, you just rent it uh, from the rummage sale. It's kind of like sweet tea. You don't really buy sweet tea, you rent it. Okay, because it goes through you so fast. But anyway... <laughs> So there you have it. It's the thing like uh, the, the rummage sale. You can be, you, it's, it's cheap. You can buy a lot of it. It's, it's all these different things. But it's not necessarily being a good steward with what we have. So as you read this, which servant can you relate to? Honestly, I'm not, we're not raising hands or anything. But as, as you think of this, which steward or servant can you relate to? And ask yourself this. Are you a good steward with what you have? With what are you the guy like the five and you're you're good steward with it? Are you a guy like the two, a guy or a woman, a man or a woman? Or are you like the person with the one, and you seem to always be out all the time? Well, if you want to know what the definition of a tithe is, whether you want to or not, I'm, I'm going to share it here. The tithe is one-tenth. I mean, that's what a tithe means. It means a tenth. You hear that word all the time throughout the Old Testament. And giving of the first fruits, you hear that throughout Scripture. And you know, I'm going to be pretty open with you guys today, as, as I always am. I used to really get nervous and shy away from talking about tithing and giving because it's such a sensitive issue or it seems to be, or it was in the past. For some reason, we can talk about everything else, but when it comes to finances, we clam up and get real tense. 
Why is that? Do we just read Scripture, we take out what we want, and we ignore the rest? Is that how Scripture was intended to be read? I don't think so. I think if it's in there, it's pretty important stuff. So I look at my life, and I look at even Monday, and as silly as this may sound, when I came in and I saw the syrup, and I know it sounds kind of silly maybe to you, and I'm being trying to be funny about it and stuff, that's so fun. Like, God, I mean, ways, just in ways like that, like that, that totally made my week, and I knew right then I'm putting those things up front, and I'm going to talk about it. God is so good. All we have, we should understand the talents and the gifts and the abilities and everything has been given to us from him. It's kind of on loan, or not on loan, but it's, it's, it's his to begin with. It's, it's what he has given to us to begin with. So I get excited now because I can point to situation, thing after thing after thing after thing after thing, Syrup story after syrup story after syrup story after syrup story. Where God has just like totally shown me that just trust me, dude. Just trust me. Like you can't outgive our Heavenly Father. It's not, I'm not doing it to get something back. I, I hope we understand that. Like I told you last week, I'm not Joel Steen. I'm not preaching uh, the prosperity gospel where if I just. If you buy a prayer hanky from us for $10 and rub it on your face, that a $10,000 check is going to show up in your mailbox. I mean, if you want to buy a $10 hanky from me, I got some. But I'm not preaching that. I Honestly, I sat and watched a pastor try. He was actually, and he believed this in his heart, explaining and this is where the jet story gets, I, you know, we always, I always say I'm going to get a jet, jokingly. This is where he, he was seriously trying to justify why he needed his own jet because he was so busy and he didn't have time to go to the airport and things like that. I kid you not, I watched it with my own eyes and the person, it wasn't a joke, it wasn't like a skit where they were being funny. He was serious that he needed and he felt God wanted him to have a jet so that he didn't have to worry about other people's schedules and that he didn't have to go to the airport and that he didn't have to wait that he could just do things as he needed to do that like are is he God because that, that's kind of what it's it sounds like he thinks that he might be the president needs his own jet I'm down with that I watch shows on Air Force One all the time I think it's fascinating I don't need my own jet I'm happy with, with, um, what I, with the cars I got. Now, I did buy a little plane, remote control plane, all right? So I satisfied that, that with that. My point is, is that it's a mindset. It's that you can't outgive God the blessings. You're here, you're breathing. You, you have a house to live in. He's taking care of you. You have more than you need. Malachi, when we talked about the tithes in chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, it says, will, I, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are you robbing me? And then the response is, in tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be enough room to store it. I'm out of room in the pantry, people. I may put those out down in the basement and get a, a workout bar and use them as weights or something. That's not going to happen. They're going to end up on pancakes, I'll tell you that. He will pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough for it. You know, I've listened to Sean for six years talk about, the, I'm not making, <laughs> I know you're all thinking, I know he talks a lot, but I, I was actually, this was a, a, a compliment. I've listened to Sean for six years talk about how this congregation 
whenever, with this uh, building fund that we've had, for six years, he has complimented and, and been in amazement of how this congregation has responded. And when tough times, tough times came, and some, Sean or somebody else would just share, hey, this is where we're at, it would come in. And we have no doubt that over these next eight or nine months, that it's going to continue and we're going to be finished. We, like we talked about last week, we're called to be generous. We're called to be love people in need. We're called to be the good Samaritan when we see someone down and out. I was going to the RC store, remote control store. Yes, I have a little problem. But anyway, I was going there yesterday to pick up a part for Camden's truck uh, drive shaft because we broke it. It was on his. And I'm in, this would be the west side on Glenwood um, of Youngstown. It's called Austintown Hobby, so I'm assuming it's in Austintown. But I'm going down, it's not the greatest part of town, and I see this older guy. There's a telephone pole at the corner, this older white gentleman at the, at the corner, and he was just holding on to the telephone pole. <laughs> and I thought he was hanging something up, like I lost my cat, or you know, like you see by Coca's that uh, um, Struthers and 170, someone's cat is always lost on that pole, I'm just telling you. <laughs> I go by there every day, or a dog. I thought that's what he was doing. So I go, I go in the hobby store, which is really fun. If you ever want to go, I'll take you. It's fun, isn't it, Cam? It's one of our favorite places. There's a racetrack in there. It's just really cool. So I go, and I'm waiting for my drive shaft because it's busy in there, probably because everyone's getting their stimulus checks in there, <laughs> stuff like that, being great stewards with their money. My part was $10, I'm just saying. <laughs> we come back. I, I leave and I come back. And I see that same guy. And this, this woman had opened up, had stopped at that intersection and opened up her car doors. And she was helping him away from the pole and getting him into her car. Obviously, something was wrong. Being the observant person that I was, I thought he was nailing a lost cat thing on the thing. But something must have been, he, he was maybe mentally ill, maybe he was physically ill, I don't know, but she stopped. And it was very clear to me that they weren't related. She was black, he was white. And she he was helping him in, he took the time. She was being a good Samaritan. That's exactly what was happening right there. Hmm. That's what we're called to do with our time, our talents, and yes, even our treasures. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. <laughs> I, love, I love this. You give a tenth of your spices, 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 mint, dill, coming. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Which goes back to me as meaning it's a condition of the heart. And where is our heart as we give? You see, I... Just for definition purposes, I told you that what a tithe is, is one-tenth. And again, just for definition purposes, an offering, and maybe I'm getting technical, it really doesn't matter when it comes down to it, because it's a thing of the heart. This is above the tithe, given to meet specific needs. Hmm. You see, in Exodus 35.5, it says, from what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Exodus 35, 5. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, and bronze. 
In 2 Corinthians verse 9, chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever spare, sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Mm. And then there's even a step farther that I just have labeled a sacrificial giving. This often means giving up things we want because we see that others have greater needs. You remember last week, if you were here, I talked about someone who earned three quarters of a million a year and decided to give $10,000 to a project that he wanted to start. That's not sacrificial giving. 10000 is a lot of money. I, I get that. But if you're at three quarters of a million a year, you're 10000 yeah, it's not that big of a deal. And this gentleman got a lot of praise for that, which made me a little bit, I don't know if I was jealous or mad, but I was just frustrated. Because I see people, actually their lives are changed because they're so generous. They drive older cars. They do things that they live well below their means because they have a heart for others and they take care of others. They're good Samaritans. Man, I'm just telling you, and you're going to think I'm crazy if you haven't experienced this, and if you haven't experienced it, I hope you do. The joy that you receive when you step out and you give sacrificially and you see how the Lord takes care of you in the long haul, I just can't even explain it. I'm not be, saying to be stupid with, with things, but I'm just saying to jo- I, this brings me joy, as silly as that sounds. I get a kick out of this. I think it's one of the coolest. Whoever did this, you can tell me or you don't have to tell me, but whoever did this, I just get a, a kick out of that. I think that's so fun. Good sense of humor. Maybe I'll bring some pancakes and we can warm them up some morning. It's amazing at what a generous heart can feel. So it leads us to our three questions, or our three points. And number one is this. Whose is it really? Whose is it? Okay, I'm glad you answered. I'm a little surprised. Thank you. It's God's. Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and for him are all things. Let me say that again. It's kind of a tongue twister. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 24, 1. Listen to this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. Amen? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. Number two. This is something my dad used to tell me. Do what you can with what you have right where you are. You have an ability. You have a talent. You have time. Do what you can with what you have right where you are. Some people tell me, and I don't have, I don't know, uh, I don't see what people give. I, I don't. That's not uh, shown to me. I only know if you've told me what what you've given. And I have. This has happened multiple times. Where someone has said, "Well, I haven't given yet because I just started a new job," or, and I don't judge people. I don't make people feel guilty. I just listen. I haven't done it this yet because I'm waiting to make more. 
I got to cut so I don't tithe. It's kind of like having a kid. If you wait till you have enough money to have a kid, when will you have them? You're not going to have them. It's never going to happen. I don't know, again, I don't know what individual families give. I don't know what you, uh, individual, what individuals, I know what my family gives. All I can tell you is even in tight times, job changes, unexpected expenses, I know Jen and I have remained faithful in that area. And all I can say is we're blessed beyond what we should be. So you can mark that up as a guilt trip from pastor. Or you can take a serious look at yourself and ask God what you need to do with the things that you've been given. You know, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago I just had this dream of doing like a local extreme home makeover for a family that needed a home or something like that. And one of you came to me and was like, when do we start? I thought that was pretty cool. You know, I read the average Christian gives 2% of their income in tithe. Whenever we have a presidential election, I always get a kick out of, they always share what they give to charitable giving. I'm laughing because it's laughable. <laughs> Especially when politicians want to give a lot of things away, <laughs> but they don't do that themselves. I just find that laughable on both sides. Maybe I just lost some of you on that. <laughs> I hope not. Because they might do it for votes. I do it because God has shown me what love is, and I believe in that love of his, and I want more people to experience that love of his. Number three, how? John 14, 23, 24. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. What's that mean? It means obedience. And it means willingness. That's what that means. Anyone who loves me will obey obedience, obey my teachings. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. I find it very interesting. So we started with the, the three servants, right? In Matthew 25. I find it very interesting that that ends on, on verse 30. And verse 31 starts with, 25:31 through 46 starts with the sheep and the goats. You ever put that together before? One right after the other? I find it very, very interesting that that's how the scripture was laid out. What are the sheep and the goats, Jonathan? I'm, thanks for asking. I'll let you know what those are. The sheep recognized that for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, kind of like that person in Glenwood hugging the pole, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. Hmm, kind of like the sharing shed, except with furniture. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Pastor Jim does a wonderful prison ministry and has visited many in, the, in those situations. 
Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? Oh, I love this. And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. That lady who stopped and helped the man hugging the pole, who was she doing that for? Jesus. Whether she knew that or not, I don't know. She was doing that, and it brought glory and honor to Jesus. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the internal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer. Ooh, it's kind of like the third servant. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? Listen to this. He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Hmm. You see, folks, when it comes down to it, it's a condition of our heart, and we're giving a portion back to God what's already His to begin with. It's a matter of the heart. I'm telling you, when we start to experience these things, even a bottle of syrup that brings joy to your crazy pastor, little things like that start to just blow up in your mind to big things. You know, this year was a fantastic, fantastic year for us. Terrible in the in fact of loss of human life, dear brothers and sisters that we lost. Wonderful in the fact of the doors that were open. You see, when we began the thought of a new youth pastor, and we threw out the idea of using the parsonage. I got to be honest, I, I didn't think he'd want to do that. But he did. And that's a good thing. Because the unity that that brought and the giving that that brought, and the men that got to, and the women who got to work on that project and clean and paint, now in Ogden. And, and uh, the window man, like, I don't know, I, I saw him earlier. There he is. Like, that day of putting in those windows, that was fun. Nobody got hurt or killed. But I'm telling you, that front window weighed a ton. I thought one of us was going down, all right? That joy of coming together and giving of your talents and your time, and many of you gave those windows and paid, that was a blessing. When we came together and, and cleaned up outside and, and did a lot of maintenance outside, that was a blessing. When we've done things, picnic in the park, church in the park, and we invite people, or VBS in the park where the community, and we, we open our doors to the, to the community, that's a blessing. When we decided to do all of these in COVID, okay, all right, or, or the, the parsonage. And uh, when we decided to do the uh, preschool during COVID, that's crazy, right? No, that's being a good steward with our times and our talents and our resources. That's exactly what that is. When we had big goals of knocking out, uh, like there's concrete back there, right? So the vision for that concrete is kind of like a speed ramp like uh, for big wheels, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, remember Big Wheels when you had them? Well, my age group had them. I, I, right? You guys remember Big Wheels? That's how we rolled, man. And if you had a good one, you had the full thing and you could slide. Oh, yeah, those were awesome. That's the vision for that. And we had concrete that was like this. Kind of like Unity Road for Big Wheels. Okay? That's what it was like. And then we were like, we'd like to get rid of that. And guess what? The wary said, okay. Remember the excavator that I used? <laughs> they fixed it. The man is a surgeon on an excavator. He got that thing in and got the concrete out. It was awesome. People like that stood up. And did some awesome things. Used their talents, their times, and their resources. And I could go on and on and on with stories like that. Personally and as a church. Man, it's a blessing. Man, it gives you a high. So do I? am I going to shy away from talking about tithing and giving to a place that loves the, giving to a place that loves the Lord and wants to see the congregation flourish, flourish, and see our community flourish? Am I going to apologize for that? Mm -mm. Because I think God has way more of this in store, figuratively speaking. Don't you shy away. Don't you shy away from being obedient from what he has to do. You take that step and you watch what kind of syrup shows up on your door the next day. God, I love you. And I thank you for a congregation that loves and wants to see the mission, which is the great commission to go and make disciples all across every corner of this world, every corner of the 6 by 6 community that we live in, Springfield Township, every corner of Mahoney, Columbiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Boardman, East Palestine, Unity, Poland, Waterford, Columbiana, every corner of this world we're called to go and make disciples. So Father, if we've been good with giving of our time, hallelujah. If we've been good of giving with our prayers, hallelujah. But God, if we've been stingy when it comes to the financial side of things, God, help us to live in obedience so that we can come to you with another hallelujah. We love you, Father. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hands have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness.
I have a little update for life classes for you. Today it'll be the same as it has been, as all the adults will be in here. Starting next week, um, I, I, I talked with Alan Rupert. He is going to come. He's, they're ready, uh, prepared to come back, and he's going to be teaching his class. So all of you in Alan Rupert's class that would like to participate, his class will be in the Red Room, which is uh, across from the bathroom. Why is it called the Red Room? Because it has red carpet. So that's that room. Uh, and then Alan Ogden's class will be in the fellowship hall uh, next week. And we're going to play it by ear as to location. So stay flexible and all, uh, it's just how it's going to be. Uh, so we'll be flexible and we'll figure it out as we go. Secondly, I need the teenagers, uh, uh, youth, to meet me up here uh, after the service, after as soon as we're done here because we're going to help Laban and Jennifer take that over to their house. So parents, don't let them sneak out. Uh, many hands make, what is it, light work, something like that. So with all of that, uh, may you have an obedient day. May your day be blessed, and may your...